Well, hello everyone. Welcome back again. Um, today we are starting, as we always do, a new chapter. And this is chapter 14, which is our beginning or the beginning of our look at genetics and inheritance. And that means we have to start with the work of one man, Gregor Mendel, an Austrian monk. I mentioned this in our last presentation right at the very end that we would be heading in this direction. Because if anyone deserves the title of the father of modern genetics, it would have to be Mendel. Because much of what Mendel developed in terms of the protocols for genetics experiments, the way everything is done, um, and the way data is analyzed using probabilities and statistics, which we continue to do today, was all put in place by Mendel doing the work that we're about to talk about. And one of the unfortunate parts of Mendel's work is that during his lifetime, his work did not get the credit that it rightly deserves. I suspect that that was partly Mendel's fault and partly just that because he was introducing a new way of looking at data using probability and statistics, something that very few, if any, scientists, if any, prior to Mendel, um, had really um, thought about doing, um, it basically meant that people really did not understand what Mendel was talking about, because he was talking about statistics and probabilities, something that people were not used to talking about in science. Um, it's also somewhat ironic that Mendel and Darwin were somewhat um, contemporaries meaning they were both alive at the same time and that after Darwin had published on the origin of species where he had proposed the requirement for genetic variation or um, as you'll come to know it, phenotype variation, the differences in physical appearance that Darwin and Wallace had both realized was significant and necessary for natural selection to operate Neither of them could explain where that variation came from. Meanwhile, sitting not more than about 500 miles away was Mendel with the solution to the problem. And we know that Mendel had a copy of Darwin's On the Origin of Species, a German copy nonetheless. And he did read it and he did make a lot of notations in the margins. The um, copy is in the Mendel Museum uh, associated with Mendel's monastery, which is still an active monastery, and you can go and visit it. It's in the city of Brno in what is now the Czech Republic. I've been there. I was there in um, the fall of 2012, and you can see a very nice display of Mendel's work. You can see some of Mendel's equipment, some of his experimental devices, and if you ask nicely and ask ahead of time, you can even get a tour of the monastery and see the room where Mendel actually lived within the monastery. Um, so there, this is not just a, a an arbitrary discussion. This is some this is something a little bit personal to me because I've actually um, visited the location where Mendel would, was working. And you also need to understand that Mendel did not do this arbitrarily. This was well thought out. This was well planned. The abbot that headed the monastery. Um, when Mendel was doing this work, spent the money to build Mendel a state-of-the-art greenhouse in which to do his work. Uh, you can still see the brick outline of the um, foundations in the lawn of the monastery across the footpath from where the museum is located within the monastery building. And it was quite a large greenhouse. And Mendel had two assistants and he was so, so thorough in his work that it took him and his two assistants two years just to do the setup work, to do the experiments. You'll understand why as we talk about the actual mechanics of what Mendel did during his, um, experiment, his experimental work. And in 1865 and 1866, Mendel gave a couple of talks um, and published one, uh, a couple of papers, one in German, and there was also an English translation of that published. Um, but by and large, the work was ignored. Certainly, we are somewhat 
certain that Darwin was likely aware of what Mendel had done. Um, it's not as if people didn't know what Mendel had done. It's just that they never really fully understood what he was talking about and never really understood the significance of what he was done. And it would not be until 1901, about 20 years or so, 25 years after Mendel died, that people suddenly recognized just what it was that Mendel had been saying and just how significant that truly was to our understanding of inheritance. And it was people grabbing onto what Mendel had found and trying to apply it in all sorts of situations that led to the development of our understanding of genetics inherit and inheritance. And we will talk a little bit about some of the things that were discovered after 1901, both in the second half of this chapter and on into chapter 15, where we'll get into some more inheritance patterns that lie outside of what Mendel would have predicted, but were discovered by trying to shape things around Mendel's predictions and realizing, no, it doesn't work. There's got to be another explanation. Um, but it all starts with Mendel. And so for the first half of this chapter, we're going to focus on Mendel's experiments, his experimental design, the two sets of experiments that he is famous for and what can be um, derived from that, the two laws of inheritance that he proposed. Um, we'll talk a little bit about solving genetics problems because it turns out that once you understand what Mendel is actually saying about the behavior of genes and by extension, the chromosomes on which they are located, we can then look back to what we learned about meiosis last, last time and explain why the, resu the results that Mendel got were actually obtained on our understanding of the behavior of chromosomes. Something that people finally started to realize again around 1901 um, when Mendel's work was quote unquote rediscovered. That's the term that most people use. Not so much rediscovered, but fully recognized for its significance. And we'll talk a little bit about how that came about when we uh, do chapter 15 in the next presentation. Um, I should also warn you that this is probably going to be a reasonably extended presentation. I have broken it up into some, into a significant number of chunks. I think there are about six of them in total because this is a very um, concept rich chapter. And it's kind of important that you go through and you pay attention to all of these concepts because all of them are significant. All of them help us understand inheritance patterns and all of them are going to be addressed um, at some point in the not too distant future on an exam. And as we go through the presentation, at each of the concept checks, there are going to be some genetics problems that are going to help you understand what it is that Mendel is saying, what it is that we know about the inheritance patterns, not only Mendel's patterns, but the um, other patterns that we're going to discuss later in the chapter, and show you how to answer questions um, revolving around those concepts because that's what ultimately you need to be able to do. And so we will play with those um, types of problems as part of this presentation, which is also one of the reasons why it's going to get a little bit long because we need to spend some time to explain the concepts in such a way that you can apply them to solving problems, which is what we ultimately want you to be able to do. So having given you that um, introduction, let's get started. So one of the issues that um, Mendel confronted when he began all of this work was that the basic understanding of inheritance patterns, which Mendel had learned about at university because he did get a university degree. He actually um, attended the University of Vienna um, because at the time, Brno and what is now the Czech Republic was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was ruled from Vienna. That was the capital city. And there was a major university there. And Mendel was sponsored to the university by his monastery. In fact, that was part of the reason why Mendel um, 
took religious orders in the first place. He was the second son of his family. And the rules of inheritance within families at that time was that all of the um, family possessions, property and so forth would go to the older son and the second son would get nothing. And so Mendel as the second son realized that the only way as most second sons would realize that the only way he was going to get an education and be able to do something with his life was to take religious orders and um, rely on the church to provide him with his education and his vocation, his um, work and so forth. And so Mendel took religious orders. He became an Augustinian monk and his monastery in Brno, where he was located, is an Augustinian monastery. It's still active, as I said, and you can go and visit it. And the people of Brno are quite proud of Mendel. There are streets and squares and one of the local universities are all named after Mendel um, because Mendel is obviously the most famous son of Brno. Um, and one of the things that Mendel almost certainly learnt at university was the currently held idea of inheritance, which is known as blending. And you are almost certainly familiar with blending if you've played with paints at any point in time. Um, so the classic one, and we'll, we'll see this a little bit later, um, is the idea of getting pink by mixing red and white. And the reason why we talk about that is because one of the most commonly accepted examples of this blending notion was to breed together some snapdragons uh, because in snapdragons you get red flowers and you get white flowers and so if you take a red flowered plant and breed it with a white flowered plant you wind up with pink flowers on the next generation of plants and the geneticist of Mendel's time said there see blending you mix red and white together you get pink that's blending what they failed to do was do what Mendel would do, take some of those pink flowers and breed them together. Because if they had bred those pink flowers together, they would realize that blending was probably not the best explanation. But at the time, it was the accepted um, explanation, or at least one of the best explanations. What Mendel would show is, however, that inheritance should be thought more of as a particulate type of pattern, inheritance pattern, where genes are actually discrete particles. And he actually talked about inheritance particles. Um, we would refer to them as genes and that other word associated with them alleles. Remember an allele is simply the flavor or the version of the gene that you happen to have. When we talked about homologous chromosomes, remember the level of difference between homologous chromosomes lies strictly at the allele level. Everything else is the same. So they may have the same genes in the same locations, which is part of the definition of homologous chromosomes, but the two versions of the genes on each of the homologous partners does not have to be the same. They could be very different alleles. And so Mendel was taught, would discover that um, on the basis of his experimental results, genes and alleles had to be considered to be discrete particles that did not blend together, they remain discrete. So the implication of the blending model as the geneticists of Mendel's day would have it is that what we now call genes and alleles were what was blending. Mendel would show that that was in fact not the case. And ultimately, we can now explain what the Snapdragon model is all about. And we'll come back and we'll take a look at the Snapdragon model later in the, in the chapter, because it's an important part of our understanding of inheritance patterns. So Mendel chose to work with garden peas. And you might ask, why work with garden peas? What's the big deal about garden peas? So um, before we go on, let me just show you a picture of Mendel. This is a very famous photo of the monks of Mendel's day in the monastery. This is the abbot that sponsored Mendel's work and built the, the glass house for him. But this is actually Mendel, the only person in the picture, by the way, holding a plant. And this plant is a fuchsia plant. It happens to be the state flower of, this, um, of the state of Moravia, which is the state within um, the Czech Republic that Renault is located in. Um, 
And so this is Mendel. Mendel would ultimately actually be elected by his fellow monks as the abbot to replace this gentleman when he passed away. And that would actually mark the end of Mendel's major contribution to science. He would never do any more um, genetics experiments. He did, before he became abbot, um, play around with bees for a little while, trying to apply his principles that he discovered in garden peas to breeding bees and was unsuccessful because bees um, reproduce very differently from flowers. They may reproduce sexually, but their reproductive pattern is very, very different. Um, but you can still see Mendel's bee house on a um, hill behind the church or cathedral that is associated with the monastery. And if you, again, if you ask nicely at the front desk of the museum and they have time, you can actually um, go for a quick tour of the bee house and see some bee boxes that Mendel designed and so forth. And this is actually uh, still used for research by the local museum because they're doing research on bumblebees as an alternative pollinator of plants um, in place of the European honeybee, honeybee which is in danger um, of becoming potentially extinct for a number of different reasons. Um, so this is Mendel, um, and these are his fellow monks. This, as I said, this is the abbot that sponsored his work. So Mendel chose to work with garden peas. So why work with garden peas? Well, there are a number of reasons, but number one, and perhaps most importantly, garden peas are capable of self-pollination. That means the pollen from the male part of the plant can pollinate and subsequently fertilize the female eggs, the pollen representing the equivalent of sperm. And we actually refer to the nuclei in the pollen as sperm nuclei. And so if you allow the um, pollen to self-fertilize the plant, it is sexual reproduction. It's not asexual reproduction. It is sexual reproduction because both the pollen and the eggs are the product of meiosis. So it is sexual reproduction. It's just that it's all done internally rather than being pollen from an outside source. It's all done internally. And this would turn out to be really, really important because during that two years that Mendel and his assistants were doing all the setup work, what they were trying to do was create something that Mendel considered to be really important for figuring out the results of his experiments and which we today still consider to be really important. He wanted to create what are referred to as pure breeding parents. So, let me just put a note in here and just say all Mendel's parentals and it was creating these pure breeding parentals that really took that two years. So what do we mean by pure breeding? Pure breeding means that generation after generation, the, flower, the plants only produce the particular version of the character that was being required or that was required. And so in the case of purple flowers, for instance, which is the purple trait of the flower color character. And I think I've defined that those terms for you again before, but I will define them for you again um, as we move on, just in case you've, you've forgotten what those mean. But um, if the purple plants are pure breeding, that means generation after generation, each generation is just going to produce purple flowers. Um, genetically, we say that the purple flower trait is locked or fixed and there's no alternative. And for Mendel, the easy way to do this was simply to take the purple flowers and put a paper bag over the top of them to prevent any other pollen from getting in. And that meant the flowers could self-pollinate and he could guarantee that it was purple pollen from the purple flower that was fertilizing the purple eggs from the purple flower. And if you do that for a couple of generations, you lock in the purple version of the flower color and you exclude any other alternative, which in Mendel's case was white. 
In fact, this was the, another reason why he chose pea plants. They had been grown for hundreds of years by people. And there were a number, hundreds in fact, of different characters that he could choose from. He selected seven in total and he chose those seven very carefully because for each of those seven characters, like flower color, the location of the flowers, the color of the seeds, the shape of the seeds, color of the seed pods, the shape of the seed pods, um, whether the plants were tall or short, these are all characters that he looked at. There were only ever two traits. So in the case of flower color, there was only purple or white. And there was none of the blending issue. The purple was purple and always purple. There was no alternative. And the white was always white. There was no alternative. So in fact, for each of the characters, he had an either or outcome. They could either be purple or they could be white. They could either be tall or they could either be short. They could either have brown seeds or wrinkle seeds. They could either have yellow seeds or green seeds. They could either have inflated pods or wrinkled pods. They could either have axial flowers growing off from the side or they could have terminal flowers. There were no alternative outcomes. So there was no confusion over which uh, trait of the character he was seeing in the offspring. It was clear cut. The fact that the plants could self pollinate also provided him with a pathway to do crossing experiments, bringing in pollen from outside plants. Because if he wanted to prevent self-pollination, that was easy to do. You just reach in with a pair of scissors and snip out the stamens, that's the male part of the flower. And so now the flower can no longer be self-pollinated. And then he could use a paintbrush, which is typically what we still do, to pick up some pollen from the flower of choice, in this case, a white flower, and brush that onto the female part of the flower known as the carpal, or more particularly, the flat area on the top, which is called the stigma, which is connected to a long ex, um, extension called the stigma, and at the base is the ovary where the eggs are going to be located. Um, and that's where the seeds will ultimately develop inside the ovary. And so he could brush the pollen onto the, the top of the carpal, and the pollen would then ultimately fertilize the eggs in the ovary. And he could allow the plants then to develop the seeds. He could collect the seeds and plant out the seeds to find out what version of each character the offspring was showing. And it would take about three months for that to happen. So he could go from one generation of flowers to the next, or one generation of plants to the next generation of plants every three months, which was convenient for him because he still had to perform his duties within the monastery. He could not escape from those. He was a monk after all, first and foremost. Um, and it turns out that the peas are pretty much um, self-supporting. He did not have to do a whole lot of work to, in terms of upkeep, because he had them in a greenhouse. Um, he could maintain a weed-free and a controlled environment. Um, and he could grow multiple generations of plants because he didn't have to worry about what, would, what the climate was like outside. Well, let me assure you, it can get really cold in Brno in winter. I was there in October, November, and it was already extremely cold. The snow hadn't started falling yet, so I can't imagine what it was like late December, early January when that started happening. Um, but having a greenhouse um, meant that Mendel could keep going with his experiments all year round. It wasn't a problem. So, there were a lot of reasons why Mendel chose the peas. They were easy to manipulate. They had some very easy to recognize characteristics. And in many cases, there were only two traits of those characteristics. Again, he chose the, the characteristics on that basis. Um, it was relatively easy. It was time consuming, but relatively easy to lock in the traits into his pure breeding parents. So he had a fixed starting point for each of his experiments. He could do his transfers of pollen quite easily and he could guarantee that it was only that pollen that was transferred by cutting out this, the male part of the flower, the stamens, keep a bag over the top until he was ready to put the, the pollen in. Once he transferred the pollen in, he could put a bag back over the top again, keep out any more foreign pollen. So it was very easy to manipulate 
the plant. And he could also very easily do what we now call reciprocal crosses, which we consider also to be a very important part of any genetics experiment procedure. A reciprocal cross goes like this. If you transfer white pollen to a purple flower, you also need to do the reverse, transfer purple pollen to a white flower, because the direction of transfer could be important. You may get a different result by adding white pollen to a purple flower versus adding purple pollen to a white flower. Because Mendel didn't know whether it made a difference or not, he realized that he really needed to do both sets of transfers to confirm whether there was a difference or no difference. And so he wrote this into his procedure and we still do that today. All of these basic ideas, knowing what your, par what your parentals are, creating pure breeding parents, doing reciprocal crosses, carefully recording all the, the results of the crosses and analyzing them statistically. These are all part and parcel of every modern genetics experiment, but it was Mendel who put all of these in place um, for the first time. So we always start with the parental generation, which we refer to as the P generation. The offspring of the P generation are referred to as the first filial. Filial is just a fancy name for offspring. So the first filial generation are the product of the parentals, and these are called the F1s. When you cross two F1s, So one of the things that Mendel started to realize, probably he'd thought about this ahead of time, but he certainly started to realize that when he saw some of these initial results for his first set of experiments, what we refer to as a monohybrid cross, where the parents differ in the traits that they show for a single character. Um, he realized that he could not stop with his F1 offspring, and you'll understand why when we take a look at the results. He realized that he really needed to go on and generate what we now refer to and what he referred to as the F2 generation. These are the offspring that are the product of the F1s. And so he could either cross two of the F1s, which we know he did, or you could allow some of the F1s to self-pollinate. It, it, it achieves exactly the same thing. Um, and we believe from the, his notebooks that we still have. Um, unfortunately, when Mendel passed away, the monks did not realize how important his notebooks were and they discarded a lot of them. So we only have a couple of his notebooks. Um, two of them are on display in the museum um, in the monastery, um, but we don't have his full set of, of notebooks anymore, unfortunately, but the notebooks that we have support all of his observations and fortunately cover some of his key experiments. We do think that he may have done some other experiments, but we don't have his notebooks to support that. Um, we only have some supposition on the basis of some of the things that we know he attempted to produce in terms of parental starting points. Um, but he realized that in order to be completely confident in what he was seeing, he really did need to generate the F2 generation. And it's fortunate that he did because if he'd stopped with his F1s, um, almost certainly he would not have derived his two laws of probability and we would not, uh, his two laws of um, inheritance. And we would not be talking about Mendel's laws of inheritance. So he was smart enough and um, cautious enough to realize that he needed to take that one step further. And it was a good thing that he did. So we now have three different generations of plants. We have the P generation or parental generation that we start with. 
the product of the P generation is the F1 generation, the first filial generation, when the first filials are allowed to either self-pollinate or are physically crossed by transferring pollen, we generate the second filial generation or the F2 generation. So this is Mendel's basic um, procedure for carrying out his genetics experiments. So just in case I didn't define character and trait for you in our previous presentation, but I believe I did. Here are the formal definitions for you again. So a character is a heritable feature like flower color or um, seed shape or seed color or anything that is a physical feature that can be inherited, can be inherited from one generation to the next. That's a character. And that is always the product of the gene. So there is a flower color gene, there is a seed color gene, there is a seed shape gene. But then each of those characters, as Mendel chose them, had two traits. So in the case of flower color, there would be the purple trait and the white trait. In the case of seed color, there would be the green seed and the, well, yellow seed and green seed. In terms of seed shape, there would be round shape versus wrinkled shape and so on. Each of the seven characters that Mendel looked at had two traits. And we now understand that each of those traits is the product of an allele. So there is a purple flower allele. There is a white flower allele. There is a green seed allele. There is a yellow seed allele. There is a round seed allele. There is a wrinkled seed allele and so on. These are the connections between gene and character, allele and trait. And it's important that you understand those connections because they help you understand the patterns of inheritance as explained by Mendel and as extended by other people as we dig deeper into inheritance patterns. So we've talked all about that. So now it's time to take our first break. So here is the concept check question. I'll see you on the other side of the break with the answer for this, but it's a pretty straightforward question. You decide to breed two purebred dogs. What are the correct genetic terms for your dogs and the subsequent two generations? I'll see you back here after the break with the answer to these questions. <laughs> 